Thanks, Lord, gave me a very special word. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Romans 8 and 28. Says, and we know that this is a very familiar scripture. But saying we're going somewhere with this that I never gone before. I never knew what I'm about to say to you before. Till the Lord revealed it to me the other day. I'm excited about this. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them that are the call according to his purpose. When he says we know that all things work together for the good. It goes beyond just saying, okay, just the idea that, okay, something bad happens to you, for example. And someone comforting you and saying, but we know all things work together. Now, that's part of it. You know, that's part of it. <laughs> Any tragedies that happen, any bad thing that happens, you might lose your house, but you can declare all things work together for my good. You see what I'm saying? So that is true. But now you got to make sure of this. To them that love God, who are the ones that love God? But the ones that Jesus said, he that hath my commandments and keeps them. He it is that loves me. Amen. So if you have his word and you keep it, you guard it, you love it, you just hold on to it. It doesn't mean you're 100% like towing the line every minute. But it means the minute you recognize that you messed up in some way, you know, you're, you're at the feet of Jesus saying, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Deliver me. I repent. You see? So people are going to have so, uh, sometimes um, stumbling blocks and things like that. But John said, I write these things unto you that you don't sin or that you sin not. He said, but if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he said, and if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. So the minute you realize, of course, that you messed up, you get right back on track. To them that love God, those that love God, God are the ones that keep the words of Jesus. They have his word and they keep his word. And it says to them that are the called according to his purpose. Now, when he says, we know that all things work together Amen. for the good. That term, work together, in the Greek means to cooperate. To cooperate. See, I'll pull it up right here. I just punch on that word. Those of you that know about this Strong's Bible app, you just punch on the word, and the Greek, you know, the original word comes up. It means to be a fellow worker. Everything becomes your fellow worker. What does the moon, the sun, the United States Congress, you see what I'm saying? Everything. It means to cooperate. Even demons have to cooperate with those that love God and those that are called, the called according to his purpose. See, but we're going to see what this really means in a few minutes. The kingdom of darkness has to cooperate with you, glory to God. Amen. They can't get in your way because all things are cooperating for your good. Yes. That means if the devil ain't got nothing good to bring, then he better keep on stepping. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. He got to cooperate. He can't do nothing against God's called people, the ones that are in love with Jesus, unless they, he gets special permission. Unless you cross the line and open the door to the devil. Otherwise, he can't do nothing to you. Because Jesus defeated him. Only thing the devil can do to us is if we give place to him. We let him in. 
through disobedience, you know, rebellion, sin, stuff like that. <laughs> so everything works together for the good, for our benefit, for the benefit of those that love God. Those that are the call according to his purpose. Amen. Now, that means everything has to work together. That means if there's any sickness in the land, sickness got to cooperate with you and not come near your dwelling. Amen? Because <laughs> the Bible says he'll keep all plagues and all diseases um, away from you. Away from your dwelling. It shall not come nigh thee. Sickness has to flee. Money has to cooperate with you. Resources. It doesn't matter if you have to get the money out of a straight cat. When Jesus and Peter had to pay their taxes one day, Jesus sent Peter to go catch a fish. He said, the first fish you see, catch it and open its mouth. It's going to have enough money in that fish to pay for my tax and your tax. Now, go ahead. <laughs> It could be a stray dog show up on your doorstep and you're like, what is this? And he opened his mouth and dropped a bundle of $100 bills. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All things have to cooperate. The dogs have to cooperate. The cats have to cooperate. The fish, the birds. God fed Elijah with ravens flying. Not that raven, but there was those flying ravens that used to fly. <laughs> they still did. <laughs> Dropping off meat for Elijah to eat in the midst of a famine. Isn't God good? Yes, that raven had to cooperate for Elijah's good. See, when you get into this realm, you'll see everything will have to cooperate with you. The wind, the storms, they have to obey you. Didn't they obey Jesus' voice? Yes. When Jesus spoke, he would calm the winds and the, and, and the waves. Now he says, to them that love God, okay, now this part, he says, those that are the called according to his purpose. Now many times we think, okay, what is God's purpose for me? And this is right to think, okay, what is God's purpose in my life as far as marriage? God, God what's your purpose for me? Thanks. Should I get married now? Is the one I'm dating the one I'm supposed to marry? Is there someone else? Should I go on Christian mingle and, 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 and mingle on there or should I not? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Those are all purposes you could be praying about. You might be praying about what is my purpose, Lord, for the ministry? What do you got for me to do? Am I called to be a teacher? Am I called to be a preacher? Am I called to be in, in helps? Am I called to be a prophet or an apostle? And as you pray, God makes known his calling. Now that's okay to pray about the purpose of God in that way. Or what job should I have, Lord? What do you want me to do as a career? Should I, should I go and finish education and get a degree or not? Those are all noble things to pray about. But there's an ultimate purpose here. See, he says, look at this carefully, for them who are the call according to his purpose. This scripture is talking about his purpose. His plans for you. And there's an ultimate plan we're going to look into today. This goes beyond just saying, okay, you know, you get saved and born again, and now you say, okay, God, what's your purpose for my life? Should I do this or do that? I'm not willing that any should perish. It's God, and, and it says, in God, it's God's will that all be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So God wants all to be saved. Turn that back down. God wants all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But this word predestinate, look what it means. It means to limit in advance or to predetermine, to determine before or to ordain 
or predestiny. Or in other words, that God has ordained who he did foreknow, he ordained a destiny for him. He also did predestiny. So he also did have a vision. He foresaw a vision for those that love him, those that responded to his calling, a certain destiny. And many people never catch a glimpse of this destiny. And it's sad that many people that God calls don't respond to his call. And some that have responded turn their backs on Jesus. And they'll never see the destiny. What destiny? We're not talking about just your destiny. As because you might be thinking, my destiny is that I'm going to be a famous movie star and I'm going to transform Hollywood. Well, that's something you're, you might do. But that's not this destiny that this word is talking about right here. There's a greater destiny than anything you can physically do on earth or be on earth. You know, someone might be thinking, my destiny is to be the greatest doctor in the state of Illinois and to glorify God in that way. Well, that might be included in God's will for you. But that, that doesn't measure up to the destiny God has planned for you, ultimately. So, what is he talking about, the destiny? See, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. He's talking about those that are called according to his purpose. To fulfill a purpose that the Father had in his own mind. Ephesians talks a lot about this, about the according to the eternal purposes of God. Let's turn there real fast as the Holy Ghost is directing me. Ephesians 1, let's look at verse, okay, let's look at verse 4. We're just going to go over some of these real fast here. According as he has chosen us, talking about the same thing, chosen, predestined, us in him before the foundation of the world. God had a vision for us, what we would be like. God had a vision of our destiny, and now we must come into that destiny. This destiny that God envisioned for us before the world began. It's bigger than your plan. It's bigger than your ministry. It's bigger than your family. It's bigger than your mate. What God is talking about. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, here's one that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's bigger than your ministry. That's bigger than your mate. That's bigger than how many children you have. Or it's bigger than the car you're going to get. This is being holy and without blame before him in great affection and great love. Having predestinated us. See? Having set a destiny for us unto the adoption of children. He, one of his envisioned destinies for us that we'd be adopted in his family as his own children. Children of the great God. Hallelujah. Of, of the eternal God. By, uh, by Jesus Christ to himself. Look, according to the good pleasure of his will. And then he says, talks about redemption, forgiveness of sins, giving a bounty to us in all wisdom and prudence. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. There's a mystery of his will, but now making it known to us according to the good pleasure which he purposed in himself. So it's not that you just...
just do what you want. Or you believe God that you will accomplish different things in life. See, that we're talking about something at a more higher level here. It's not God conforming to your plans. But it's us now conforming to his purpose, which he purposed in himself. You can find out too. And, and we're about to find out today. Amen. Amen. He says, he talks about some more things here. He says here, in whom we also have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated, having a destiny prepared for us, according to the purpose of him, see, who works all things after the counsel of his own will. And we're going to skip a few of this here, I'm sure. And there's other places here where he, he talks about according to the eternal purposes. I believe it's Ephesians 3. to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this is what we're talking about. Now back to e, uh, back to Romans. We're talking about something on a higher level but reachable right now while we're on earth. We're in Romans 8 in verse 29. So, all things will work together, cooperate together for those that are called according to his purpose. Those that are walking in his purpose, not your own purpose. And what is his purpose? For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. This is it. To be conformed. This is it. To the image of his son. What's his purpose? What's the eternal purposes of God? Who does all things work together for the good for? Those that come into the destiny of being conformed to the image. Conform means to be jointly formed or similar to or fashioned to. To be conformed to the image or the likeness or the resemblance of his son. Amen. Talking about Jesus. Someone say Jesus. 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 So all things now. See, when you move into the dimension where you begin to think like Jesus. See, being conformed to the image of his son Jesus, part of it is you begin to think like him. Naturally. You can't be like him if you don't think like him. You begin to speak like Jesus. Your heart I'm talking about your spiritual man begins to feel what Jesus feels in compassion for the lost, in mercy for your fellow brother or sister, in joy of the Holy Ghost, wisdom from heaven. Everything Jesus is, you're being confused into that image, into that likeness, into that resemblance. So that wherever you go, whatever you do, 
people are catching a glimpse of Jesus through you. Those are the people that all things will begin to cooperate for. Those that are walking in Christ, walking in his resemblance, walking in his likeness. That's why Jesus was able to step out on the water when his, his friends were in trouble on the sea. He told them he'll meet them on the other side. And in the midst of a storm, he just steps out and starts walking on the water. You see, that water had to cooperate with the Son of God. Amen? <laughs> now, he says that those that are conformed to the image of the Son... And it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what you were before. This ain't a natural work. This, is some, this isn't something you can't do. You're going to a self-help class or a self-help seminar. It's not nothing you can do on your own power. But we're talking about an operation that happens in your life through faith in the Word of God. Through faith in Jesus Christ. And look what it says. You're conformed to the image of the Son that he might be the firstborn. We're going to look at that today. Among many brethren. All of us having his resemblance, all of us having his likeness, he's the firstborn, and we all have a similarity. Two. Among many brethren. What does it mean that he's the firstborn? Let's look at Colossians 1. And verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. And look at this, the firstborn from the dead. The firstborn from the dead. What is he talking about? But he's talking about that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brethren. You're not really as his brethren in this sense until you get born again. You get reborn. Jesus was the firstborn from the dead. Amen. That means, and we, we touched on this many times over Christmas time and different things like that as we were talking, Jesus came into the earth born through the virgin but the seed was from his father, but he became a man. And as a man, he lived, of course, by the power of the Holy Spirit. He limited himself and humbled himself to be fashioned after the manner of a man, the Bible says. He was a real man. The first dream, I wasn't, I wasn't even intending to say this, but the Lord put it in my mind. The first dream where I saw Jesus in a long, this is like when I was in my 20s. I was standing in a yard, in like a, a grass yard, but there was a fence and a gate. I'm sure I shared this before. And I look over there, now I'm, I'm about this far from here to where, you know, that wall is over there, and I'm looking at an angle, and I see Jesus standing at the gate with some other men in back of him. I don't know who they were. But when I saw him, I said, there's Jesus. And I ran to him. And that's when I leaped on him. I wrapped my arms and legs around him <laughs> in this dream. And I remember when he looked at me, I'm looking up at him. I could see his hair, his beard, everything. But in that dream, I got a revelation of him as a man. I saw his manness his, his, and his humility 
as a man. And I remember he just looked down at me and was smiling. But in that dream, and when I woke up, I remember I was like, he seemed so humble and just so down to earth. And God was letting me know that the Son of God became a man for real. I mean, he was a man. <laughs> he slept. He ate. When they beat him, he hurt. He, just like if he took one of us. You know, if they took one of us and put nails in our hands, he hurt the same way yes. as a man. Yes. Yes. And as a man, when it says he was the firstborn from the dead, because as a man, he lived on this earth. Of course, we know his ministry and what he did in the will of God. Then was nailed to the cross. And he began to experience death. He began to experience the separation from the Father. Because sin was put on his own body on that tree. He became sin for us. The Bible says he became sin. Who knew no sin. And the death he experienced was the death that Adam experienced when he died in the day that he ate the fruit. He, he experienced the death of spiritual uh, deadness between him and God. And so did the human race receive that death. The Bible says that it passed upon all men from Adam Amen. to Moses. And then the law came. But that spiritual death is what Jesus began to experience while he was still physically alive. He, and the Bible says he tasted death death for every man. Amen. Then he died physically. And that's part of it. He died physically and went down into the center of the earth where the dead would go. Paradise was down there. This is before Jesus led them up on high. Now they're all in the heavenly kingdom. Um, and of course hell was down there. But there was a great gulf fixed between them. Amen. Jesus explained all this. And they could actually see each other. But heaven was a glory. I mean, uh, the paradise was a glorious place in the middle of the earth. It had a sky, trees, everything. It was nice. Now hell has taken over all of that, you know. And, you know, because Jesus released all his people from there. Amen. And they're, in, they're in the spirit realm in the heavenly kingdom where the paradise is up there and the new Jerusalem is the great city of heaven where God's throne is now and the kingdom of God is fully active and they're fully active with us and we're active with them, amen? <laughs> and they're making things more plain to us down here on earth and so what happened when Jesus went down there now he experienced death as a man and went down in there. But when he came back, when the scripture was fulfilled that death could not hold him because there was no iniquity found in him, then Jesus became the firstborn from the dead. That's why we have to be born again. Amen. Jesus went through it through us, so he became the firstborn from the dead. Went into death, and in a way, he went through like a rebirthing process for us. So through faith in him, that we can be rebirthed also from the dead. Now he's the firstborn from the dead. But we are the second, third, and fourth, and fifth born from the dead. <laughs> when we're born again, we are also born from the dead. So we don't have to die no more. That's why Jesus said, he that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And if he lives and believes in me, he will never die. So you sh someone said, I shall never die. And you all are born again. So when Jesus was the firstborn from the dead, he says, 
Back in uh, in Romans, remember where he said, those that he predestinated us to be conformed to the image of his son, who is the beginning, or, and it says, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. This is where Jesus began to start a whole new race of people who've been reborn now. When you're born again now, see, when Jesus rose from the dead, now he can never die again. You tasted death for every man. That means when you believe in Jesus, you're born into life eternal. Never to fear death. See, the Bible says he tasted death for every man that he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. See, that's in Hebrews 2 if you want to look it up later. That he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. All of that, Jesus destroyed the devil. Jesus destroyed and brought to nothing the power of the devil concerning you. So when you're reborn again now, that's how you you that's how now your old nature is passed away. Your old man dies in that death. See, you become buried with him. What you were before dies and you become buried with him into death. The old man is put to death with Christ on the cross. Then you when, when Jesus rose from the dead, the Bible said, if you then be risen with Christ, now seek those things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Because you've been risen with him now. When, when you're born again, you're born and you receive special eternal glory and, 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 and the eternal nature of Jesus' Father. See, look at what it says here in Colossians 1 and 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet or fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Why in light? Because it says, who have delivered us from the power of darkness, from the authority of darkness. He delivered us from the jurisdiction that Satan had over us. We've been delivered from the power of darkness and translated now into the kingdom of his dear son. You've been translated out from the authority of darkness and now you are, you have been translated. It says, and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So while we're on earth, we're in the kingdom. Remember John, the apostle said, I, John, who am also in the patience and in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And writing unto you. That was in the book of Revelation chapter 1. So we are in his kingdom, in his realm. And guess what? In the kingdom of Christ, we all look like Jesus. <laughs> It means the reign and the rule and the royalty of Jesus. That's what that word kingdom means. We've been translated into the royalty of Jesus. When you were under the power of darkness, you looked like the darkness. Never, some, some people, you know, walking around all sad and mad and bad. Under darkness, you know. Kingdom of Satan. Never can be sure what comes out of their mouth. It could be gossip. It could be lies. It could be cussing. You see? 
That's all under the authority and the jurisdiction of the darkness of Satan. When people dwell in that realm, demons just directing people under the... See, when you're under the authority and jurisdiction of darkness, you got demons just leading you and you don't even know it. The ones that say, I don't even believe in that there's a devil. Satan got them full blown. <laughs> you don't even know it. Satan is their friend and they don't even know it. Demons just all in their life. Jesus. Demons can act real nice to the boss. Demons could just be tenderly. That's it. Just keep going. Demons could be opening doors on their job so they get more money so that they won't even think about Jesus. And they could be feeling good. Demons bringing women their way and them heading so they could have wild parties and just think that they're living it up. See? And demons just opening doors Jeez. for them. Amen. Why? So that in the end, that person don't even think about Jesus. Amen. Them same demons will appear viciously and grab them by the neck and dra drag them right into hell and throw them in fire. Yes. Say, so that's what you get. But we've been, we've been delivered from that authority of darkness. We've been delivered from the power of darkness. Yes. Translated now into the realm of Jesus' kingdom. Yes. Into the kingdom of God's dear son. Thank you. The reign. The reign of Christ is happening on earth in his people right now. We're taking the land. Step by step, we're moving forward. Yes. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. See, that's why in verse 18 he says, And he is the head of the body, who is the beginning. The firstborn from the dead. And back to Romans now. Eight and. Twenty-nine. He predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So that's how all things work together for us. You can read it like this. You can start with verse 29. And say, those that he thought of, those that, in the beginning, you can read like this in verse 29. God planned that people, way in the beginning, before they even came to the earth, he planned the destiny that they would all be like his son, Jesus. After Jesus went into death and came back alive and now glorified. See, Jesus went through a whole process. When he went into death and he was raised from the dead. He was on the earth still. For a little while. And he was going to go be glorified. <laughs> and so now he's in the glorified state. So those that he he made a destiny for them to be conformed to the image of his son. And that God would call them according accordingly for that purpose. And that all things would work together for them. See, the Bible says that even the creation waiteth and groaneth for the manifestation of the sons of God. This is what it's talking about when he says that. It's in here in Romans 8. See, look what it says. In Romans 8 and verse 20, 21, he says, because the creation itself, glory to God. We're touching some deeper stuff here. Look at verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature, of the creation, 
waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's those that are being reborn and being conformed to the image of the son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. If you're Jesus' brethren, you're also the sons of God. And the creation itself is groaning. The oceans are groaning. The animals are groaning. The skies and the, the ozone layer is groaning. For the manifestation of the sons of God. So that we would be manifest in the earth. So that we would do the things that Jesus said. Jesus said, he that believes in me, the works that I do shall he do also and greater works than these shall he do because I'm going to my father but the sons of God are going to be here manifest and doing greater things than what Jesus would do because we're all his brothers Amen. he says for the creation was made subject to vanity but the creation itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption in the glorious liberty of the children of God. We were delivered from the bondage of corruption already. Into the glorious liberty of being God's children. This is an actual transformation. It's a transference of who you are and what you were into what God's destiny is for you. And his destiny is that you be conformed and be fashioned to the image of Jesus. You are to look like Jesus. When you begin to step into that realm, then this, is, this scripture applies to you more than ever before. Now, you receive that inheritance by faith. It's given to you by faith. But you want to see it in reality. You want the manifestation to appear. See, if you don't know how to control your tongue, you know, like we said the other day, the manifestation hasn't been completed in your life. If you can't control your tongue, like James said, he said, you're, you just seem to be religious, but your religion is in vain. But you might have received that inheritance now. It's your destiny to be conformed to his image. But you haven't moved into it. You haven't manifested yet. Into the image of God. All right. So. That's why he says. All right, after verse 29, he says, moreover, in verse 30, moreover, whom he did predestinate, those who he prepared this destiny for, then he also called, he invited them. You've been invited. You've been invited. Then he also justified. When you responded to the calling, you became justified. You, you've been declared innocent. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. Amen? Amen. All right, now a few, a few scriptures we're going to look through as we close. One is in Romans 5, verse 1. And there, this is why it says, therefore being justified by faith, being declared innocent, rendered innocent by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But look at this. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace where we stand. And look at this part. And rejoice in hope of the glory of God. See, we just read in Romans 8 and 30 where he says, 
whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. Our destiny is to be conformed to his image. Now, and not just his image on the earth, but our divine destiny is so that we will one day be glowing in that glory that Jesus has. That's our destiny. That's what I saw when I actually was...